Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. We're continuing our discussion of the Great Depression era and the presidency of FDR, and in particular, the New Deal. In previous lectures, we've talked about some of the acts of the first New Deal and how the nation responded to it uh, in the form of voices of protest from both sides of the political spectrum. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the next phase in the New Deal, what's known as the Second New Deal. In the previous lecture, we talked about the criticisms of FDR and the New Deal coming from both sides of the political spectrum. But despite any growing criticisms, the Democrats won a sweeping victory in the 1934 midterm elections. And as I discussed in the previous lecture, Democrats then had a 69 to 25 advantage in the Senate and 319 to 103 in the House. So nearly a three quarters advantage in both houses of Congress. Harry Hopkins, one of FDR's closest associates, friends, and one of the leading New Dealers, said in the aftermath of that election, we've got to get everything we want. It's now or never. Beginning in 1935 then, uh, FDR began catering somewhat to the voices of protest coming from the left, Huey Long, Upton Sinclair, Charles Coughlin, and others. The complaints from the left allowed FDR to pass broader legislation for social reform. Collectively, these new acts are known as the Second New Deal, beginning in 1935. Let me just first mention some of the conditions that made the Second New Deal possible. Wasn't a first New Deal sufficient? Well, in some ways not, and there was call for more action. So some of the conditions included sweeping popular support, and as I've mentioned, those greater majorities in both houses of Congress. Certainly the pressure from Huey Long and Upton Sinclair coming from the left compelled FDR to move a little bit more in that direction. Another motivation behind this second wave of legislation were some of the acts of the first New Deal that were already in place awaiting more funding or action, and in some cases acts of the first New Deal that were overturned by the Supreme Court. And so frustration with the courts was another motivation behind this. It encouraged FDR to appeal to the masses even more. There was a sense of okay, these nine old men on the Supreme Court are going to overturn an act. We're just going to pass more legislation with the support of tens of millions of Americans. And finally, there were a growing number of advisors within his administration that accepted federal spending as a means of ending the Great Depression. And there was a growing acceptance of the idea that deficit spending was okay in a circumstance of grave economic emergency. That is, a willingness to break with the balanced budget, which FDR would do for the first time as part of the Second New Deal. So in general, these forces compelled FDR and Congress to embark on the Second New Deal. And for the sake of your studying, you might think in broadest terms that the First New Deal was all about relief and recovery. And the Second New Deal, while, while there is certainly some aspect of relief and recovery, the Second New Deal was more about lasting social reform. These acts sought to care for the elderly, the unemployed, workers, farmers, and the unfortunate. In large measure, it was the Second New Deal that created the welfare state that we have today. The Second New Deal began in 1935 with the passage of the $5 billion Emergency Relief Appropriation Act, which was renewed several times in the next few years and ultimately spent more than $11 billion. FDR used that money to consolidate and refund programs that were already in place with some 30 million people employed. Other money created New programs, like the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, which was headed by Harry Hopkins and funded to the tune of about a million and a, a billion and a half dollars. 
and this primarily went to works programs for the unemployed. Uh, it completed many projects, although there was some competition with other New Deal agencies already in place for funding and in some cases for projects to complete. And there were some shortcomings of this program. Uh, while it did employ tens of thousands of workers, uh, the projects were not always well thought out or planned out, and wages remained less than the national average. But some of the most popular programs in the New Deal itself came out of the WPA. Programs like the Federal Theater Project, the Federal Writers Project, and the Federal Arts Project. We've already talked a little bit about some of these as part of the Harlem Renaissance. These programs brought the arts to the masses, uh, and many of those kinds of workers, the, the cliché of the starving artist or the starving actress, was certainly true during the Great Depression. And these programs provided much needed work for many who were uh, working in the arts. And it provided funding for public performances, plays, murals, uh, urban beautification, and so on. Another program created by this act was the Resettlement Administration, which was run by Rexford Tugwell. And this was designed to move urban slum dwellers and poor farmers into modern towns. It created what were called greenbelt towns, typically located outside of large urban centers. This was considered one of the best run and well-meaning of all the New Deal programs. Tugwell was a capable administrator uh, and a genuine and caring man. He sought equal benefits and representation for blacks and worked for residents to gain outright ownership and mortgages rather than simply renting or leasing. This program spoke to the collective settlements that had been called for by Upton Sinclair and some others and actually moved in that direction. Ultimately, this program was merged into the Department of Agriculture in 1937 and ultimately disbanded during World War II. And finally, this act created the National Youth Administration, which developed a vast scholarship program and work studies programs for students, and also developed after-school programs and programs for high school dropouts. This became a favorite program of Eleanor Roosevelt, and her work with the youth of the country was only one of many aspects of her activism. So let's talk about some of the other acts of the Second New Deal that, again, were more directed at lasting social reform. So one of the most important was the Wagner Act, or the National Labor Relations Act, which was passed in July 1935 at about the same time that the NRA was declared unconstitutional. And so this is an example of one of those acts kind of replacing uh, the better elements of programs that had been ruled unconstitutional. It was drawn up by Robert Wagner, who was from New York, a close associate of FDR. But Wagner had also been on the scene way back in 1911 during the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, the tragic uh, fire that burned down the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory with hundreds of people killed. And from that moment on, Wagner had made it his life's mission to reform and improve working conditions in the country. So this act was his crowning achievement. It is sometimes known as Labor's Magna Carta, its key cluster of rules and laws. There were many elements to it, including the fact that workers could now join unions of their choosing. It also ruled that strikes were legal. It also struck down many uh, suspicious or nefarious industry practices, like yellow dog contract, which was a, a type of contract that you might be able to join a union in a factory, but when you signed your contract, there would be a clause in it in which you swore away your right to join a union. Uh, company unions were illegal. Blacklists were illegal, according to to this act. So it's a very powerful act for industrial workers. It does have the shortcoming, though, that it doesn't apply to many of the workers around the country, like agricultural workers, domestic workers, part-time or seasonal workers. 
because there are limits to the extent to which those kind of things can be regulated. But otherwise, this was a very powerful act for workers. And just note that once and for all, it secures the right of workers to form and join unions. Another of the signature acts of the Second New Deal was the Social Security Act. Uh, instrumental in drawing up this program was the Secretary of Labor, Francis Perkins, who consulted closely with FDR in designing this act. At one point, FDR told Perkins, there's no reason why everybody in the United States should not be covered. I don't see why not. Cradle to the grave. From the cradle to the grave, they ought to be in a social insurance system. So you might think about Social Security in that context, cradle to the grave care provided by the government. So this is an example where FDR was encouraged by those activists from the left, like Huey Long and Dr. Francis Townsend and others who called for care for the elderly. But it didn't represent a major reshuffling of national wealth. We were not taking from the rich and giving to the poor. As most of you probably know even now, Social Security is covered by a payroll tax. So each individual pays into the Social Security program, and when they retire, it will be there for them. The original Social Security Act included, again, this cradle-to-the-grave kind of care. Most notably, and we all think about Social Security as old age pensions, but originally it also included unemployment compensation and aid to dependent children, which has since been removed and is a separate program that we would call today welfare. But like the Wagner Act, there were some limitations on the Social Security Act. Similarly, it did not cover domestic workers. It didn't cover uh, many other workers because it relies on a payroll tax. So you have to be on a payroll to qualify. And other kinds of workers, like, for instance, restaurant workers or those who rely on tips, uh, may not pay into the system enough to cover themselves fully in retirement. Nonetheless, this was a huge step in providing that cradle-to-the-grave care that FDR desired. The final act of the Second New Deal that I want to emphasize is the Fair Labor Standards Act, which was passed in June of 1938. It's the last major act of the New Deal, and again represents lasting social change. It addressed some of the lingering work-related issues that had not yet been addressed by other acts. So, for instance, it outlawed child labor. It established the minimum wage, at that time set at 25 cents an hour. Of course, it's gone up many times since then. And it also limited standard work hours uh, at that point to 48 hours a week. And again, the standard work week has now come down to 40. But there were still some limitations. For instance, it said nothing about equal pay for women uh, who were doing equal work as men. So this chart represents a quick summary of many of the major acts of the New Deal, both the first New Deal and the second New Deal. You see most of the first New Deal represented here uh, in the dates of 1933, and then the second New Deal including Social Security, the Wagner Act, the WPA, and the Fair Labor Standards Act. By 1936, when FDR was up for re-election, he was riding the popularity of these acts to unprecedented heights. And we will discuss his re-election in 1936 and some of the acts of his second term in the next lecture.